So hello again, step-by-step -step scientists, and welcome to today's talk, which will be part two of the gas turbine technology series, where we discuss the ideal Brayton cycle. And the ideal Brayton cycle is the thermodynamic cycle that all gas turbines are using and designed around. If you haven't watched my first video yet on an app introduction to the applications of gas turbine technology, I would suggest you go do so. But otherwise, let's get started. And we're going to start, uh, of course, the ideal Brayton cycle, and we're going to start with uh, talking about the processes that make up this cycle, and then show how to calculate some of the most important quantities uh, of the ideal Brayton cycle. Lastly, we are going to uh, present an example and show how an engineer would actually approach a design problem using the Brayton cycle analysis. So the reason that we actually conduct the cycle analysis is to get from the customer requirements to our most important engineering quantities. Typically a customer or a market analysis study that you do will present you with some uh, requirements for a gas turbine. Those are going to be the amount of power or thrust that's required depending on the gas turbine application, the maximum allowable fuel consumption that the gas turbine uh, can have, and also you are going to be working within size, weight, and cost constraints for your customer. So the cycle analysis allows us to determine uh, how much air mass flow, compression, and uh, fuel burn or temperature are going to be required to meet the customer's needs. Now the Brayton cycle can be shown on what's called the uh, pressure volume or PV diagram. And the first thing that you're gonna notice is that this is an open cycle. So we're gonna have air entering our system from the outside uh, environment and going through our thermodynamic uh, process stages of compression, combustion, uh, and expansion. And then we're going to take whatever energy is left in those gases and vent them out into the atmosphere where they're going to dissipate and become a part of the surrounding environment once again. So we move from point two to point three via an isentropic compression process. Uh, point two is at the beginning of the compressor and point three at the outlet of the compressor. And what this isentropic process means is that we're able to compress the gas without increasing its entropy at all. Entropy is a measure typically of the chaos or disorder of our system as it's described. And this is a little abstract, but uh, what it translates to practically is inefficiency. So if we move from one, process, from one point to another isentropically, we actually do so perfectly and without any uh, losses to the efficiency of our system. So when we compress the gas, we reduce its volume and increase its pressure. And then we're at point three, which is the outlet of the compressor and the inlet of the combustor. At this point, we're going to add fuel into our system and burn it to drastically increase the temperature. Uh, this is also going to increase the volume, as you see, but it happens uh, at a constant pressure. And we're moving across these dotted lines here that represent lines of constant temperature. So we're going from a fairly cool point to a much warmer point at point four. Once we reach point four, we've actually added all of the energy in our system that we're going to add. So we're ready to extract uh, work out of the system using our turbine for a productive process. And this is going to happen similar to the compression process. It's going to be an expansion process that ha happens isentropically and we're going to expand that gas and return it down to the uh, original pressure of our, of, our, of our system, the same pressure that we had at point one, points one and two. But we're going to be at a slightly higher temperature, so we're going to reject that heat into the atmosphere by venting those gases out of our system where they become a part of the surrounding environment once again. We can also show this process, uh, the Brayton cycle, on what's called the temperature entropy or TS diagram. And the TS diagram is a great way of visualizing not only the temperatures in our system, but also the inefficiencies uh, because it shows the entropy. So again, very similarly, we move from point two to point three via an isentropic compression process, which is just a vertical line. We move across these dotted lines of constant pressure and we can see that the temperature is increasing. And this can be shown with the ideal gas relationship and there's another excellent video on step-by-step -step science that deals with the ideal uh, gas relationship. Once we add the fuel into our system and combust it, we drastically increase the entropy and temperature of our system, but we're moving along this dotted line here of, uh, of constant pressure up to 0.4, which is going to be the hottest temperature in our system. And then we're ready to expand those gases, again, doing a lot of useful work in the process. So from 0.4 to 5, 
we uh, expand our gases back down to the ambient pressure, the temperature is going to reduce, but it's a vertical line, so we don't have any uh, additional entropy or additional losses. Uh, once we get to 0 0.5, then we've taken all of the work out of our gases that we can. So we take whatever's left. You can see we're left with a higher temperature and a higher entropy than where we began. And this is always going to be the case. And we take whatever's left and we reject it into the atmosphere uh, where it becomes part of the surrounding environment once again. So that is uh, the processes that make up the Brayton cycle. And we now are going to be interested in calculating some of the most important properties. And one of the most important properties is the network or the productive work that our system can do. You can see that for each process here, we're either taking energy in or rejecting energy out of our system. So we put work in to compress our gas, we put heat in to combust it, and then we take work out to expand it, and then whatever's left, we reject heat out of our system again. So this can be shown, it can be shown that if you sum up all of the energy movement that's happening in our system, you're going to be left with zero because energy via the first law of thermodynamics always has to be conserved. We're going to define that energy going into our system is positive and energy that comes out of our system is going to be negative. And this is the typical convention. So we, we have work going from two to three and work going, work, work going into our system from two to three and work coming out of our system from four to five. So if we sum these up, we're actually going to be left with the network that we can use for our productive process in our system. Some of the work that comes out of the turbine has to go to driving the compressor and whatever is left over is going to be used in a productive process. So the sum of these has to be equal to the sum of the heat addition and heat rejection process that our system is going through. So again, we add heat in from three to four and we take it out from five to one. So we can write that expression as the network is equal to the sum of the heat we add in plus the sum of the heat we take out. And again, this Q five to one, the heat we take out is going to be a negative value. So how do we actually uh, represent these uh, heat addition processes using, uh, let's say more useful uh, parameters. And the way that we can do that is expressing this heat as the difference in enthalpy between the two states through which we're adding our heat. And if this is a constant pressure process, we can simplify this even further to say that it's equal to the mass flow of the fluid in our system, in this case will be air, times a parameter we call CP, which is a property of our fluid called the specific heat capacity. And the specific heat capacity is a measure of how much energy we have to add to our system to increase its temperature by one degree Celsius. We then take uh, this product here, those, these two constants, and multiply it by the temperature difference between our two states. So for our heat addition process from three to four, we have the mass flow times the specific heat capacity times the temperature difference between points three and four. For the heat rejection from five to one, we have the mass flow again times the specific heat capacity again times the temperature difference from points five to one. And again, the point temperature at point one is going to be lower than that at point five, so we can expect that this will be negative. If we then take these expressions for the heat addition and heat rejection process and plug it back into our expression for the network, we're left with this expression for the network, which is the mass flow times the specific heat capacity. These two are constants. And then we multiply that by the sum of the temperature differences uh, during our heat addition and heat rejection processes. So this is the network that our system produces. We then probably wanna have an expression for the efficiency of our system as well. And we define the efficiency as the amount of useful work output that we have divided by the total energy input that we have to give to our system. This is the network divided by the heat in process. You can see that here. So we have already from the previous slides, our expression for the network, and we also have our expression for the heat in process, which is our Q from three to four here. That's the heat that we put in. So we can simply plug these uh, expressions in for a network and heat into our efficiency. And we're left with this large looking expression here. That is uh, these constants here multiplied by the sum of our temperature differences and our temperature difference 
for the heat addition process. One thing I'm going to note is that we can also express the amount of energy we put into our system in terms of the fuel flow that we have. Because if fuel is chemically homogeneous, we can actually express the heat in as the mass flow of our fuel times this parameter here called the lower heating value, which is the amount of energy that a certain mass of fuel can produce when it's burned. So it's thought of as the energy density of the fuel. So keep that in mind for some of the later slides. But we're going to take this uh, expression for efficiency now that we have using the temperatures, and we're going to simplify it. And the first thing that we can do to simplify this expression is cancel out this mass flow in Cp, because these are constants for our fluid and constants for our system. We're then left with this expression uh, of the temperature differences, and I've used a minus sign here to make it a bit more clear that this is going to be a negative value. But we have a common denominator for these. And uh, what we're going to do then is uh, break up this expression using the common denominator, and we're left with 1 minus the temperature difference from our uh, heat rejection process divided by the temperature difference during our heat addition process. Now, in engineering, we always like to express things in terms of ratios of, of temperatures, ratios of pressures. So I'm then going to take out our T1 or T2 ambient uh, temperature and our T3, the temperature after the compression, and what we're left with is an expression uh, in terms of the temperature ratio during our compression process. And each of those temperatures is then multiplied by the temperature ratio during our heat addition or heat rejection process. Now we're going to uh, want to consider this uh, ratio here for a little bit. And we're going to use the ideal gas law to do so. The ideal gas law says that the pressure is equal to the density times the uh, universal gas constant, ideal gas constant, times the temperature. And we can write then an expression for the temperature that is the pressure at, of, of our state divided by the density uh, times R. So if we plug those in for our expressions T5 over T1 and T4 over T3, we're actually going to see that uh, the P5 and P1 are going to be equal because this is uh, pressure during our constant pressure, heat rejection, and heat addition processes. So we can actually cancel out uh, these expressions for the pressure here. And these R's are also going to be equal because it's a universal property of our fluid, so we can cancel that out as well. And what we're left with is simply a ratio of densities during our heat addition and heat rejection processes. Uh, what we're going to be able to say is that because our uh, compression and expansion processes are happening isentropically and we return the fluid to the same pressure at which it began, we can actually write that these ratio of densities are actually going to be equal to each other. And when we're able to write that, we're able to then say that the ratio of temperatures is equal to each other. We can then cancel out these expressions because these terms uh, are simply uh, constants, and, uh, and that allows us to cancel it out. So we're left with a very simple expression for the efficiency. That's 1 minus the ambient temperature divided by the temperature after the compression process. Now what we then like to do is maybe express this uh, efficiency in terms of a pressure ratio as well. Pressure ratio, or the uh, ratio of, of the pressure at the end of the compression process divided by the beginning or the ambient pressure, is one of the most important properties for our gas turbines. And if we're compressing or expanding something isentropically, we can actually use this expression here to relate our temperature and pressure ratios. Uh, that involves the use of this constant here, gamma, which is uh, related to our heat capacities. And for every fluid, that's a constant. So for air, it equals 1.4, provided that our air is an ideal gas. So we can take this expression for the temperatures and simply replace it with this expression of the pressure ratio to the power of our gamma, um, gamma expression here. And we can simply say that this P1 over P3 is actually 1 over the pressure ratio because the pressure ratio we define as P3 divided by P1. So then we can write, rewrite our expression in terms of uh, just a one parameter, the pressure ratio, and say that the efficiency is 1 minus 1 over the pressure ratio to the power of gamma minus 1 over gamma. So there we have an ex uh, expression for the efficiency in terms of temperatures, 
but also in terms of pressures, provided that our compression and expansion processes are isentropic. So let's talk about an example now. And we're going to start with an example that says a coastal power plant requires a gas turbine that will produce 10 megawatts of electricity and consume no more than 0.55 kilograms per second of diesel fuel. The customer is going to have a tight budget, so we're not allowed to use uh, uh, fancy materials, only conventional materials and only conventional technologies. So we're going to answer the most important questions about the cycle. What combustion temperature are we going to use? What efficiency do we want the cycle to have? What is going to be the required pressure ratio for that efficiency? And what air mass flow is going to be needed for our system? We're going to assume that all our processes are perfect. That means the compression and expansion is isentropic and the combustion will be isobaric, which is what the word that we use to express constant pressure. We're also going to assume that our air is an ideal gas and it's calorically perfect. So the first steps, uh, we know that if we're located on the seacoast, we're going to be at zero meters above sea level. And we can use the standard values for zero meters above sea level. That is to say, the ambient pressure will be 1.0135 bar. The temperature will be 288.15 Kelvin and the density will be 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed. Then we know that we're only going to be using conventional materials. And by conventional materials, we're going to be using probably a stainless steel uh, potentially uh, an inconel, a uh, nickel super alloy, and that's going to limit our maximum working temperature at the outlet of our combustor to 1000 degrees Celsius. And we're actually going to choose a maximum temperature of 927 degrees Celsius or 1200 Kelvin. That's a little bit below the maximum working temperature because every 25 degrees Celsius that we increase our maximum temperature, we actually cut the lifetime of our turbine in half. And the turbine is one of the most expensive components in the engine, so we want it to have a long lifetime because we don't want to be replacing that component very often. So we're going to choose a maximum temperature of 920 degrees Celsius or 1200 Kelvin. We also have some constants here. Uh, we know that the specific heat capacity is 1005 joules per kilogram Kelvin. We know that gamma is going to be 1.4. And we know that the energy density or lower heating value of our diesel fuel is going to be 43.2 megajoules per kilogram. Then at the outlet of our combustor, we know that the maximum temperature is going to be 1200, but we don't know the pressure. And we also don't know what the mass flow of our system is. So uh, we've determined the maximum temperature, and now let's try and determine the efficiency, which is going to be the network out divided by the fuel energy that we have to put in. We know that the network out is uh, 10, watt, 10 million watts or 10 megawatts. And we can go back to this uh, slide here to show that the heat energy that we put in is equal to the mass flow of our fuel times our fuel energy density. You'll recall that we have to use 0.55 kilograms per second of fuel. And we know that the fuel energy density is 43.2 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. When we combine all of that together, we get a efficiency of 42.09%, which is a fairly high efficiency for a gas turbine. We can then take that uh, efficiency that we calculated and use it in our expression for the pressure ratio. So we plug in 0 0.4209 for our uh, pressure ratio, for our efficiency, excuse me, and rearrange to show that the reciprocal one over the pressure ratio uh, to, to the power of gamma minus one over gamma is equal to 0 0.5791. We then take the reciprocal and by taking to the root of gamma minus one over gamma, we can show that the pressure ratio should be 6.766. So now we have the maximum working temperature of 1200 Kelvin, efficiency of 42.09% and a pressure ratio of 6.766. So what we need now is the air mass flow. And the air mass flow, we're going to use the expression for the network, which has air mass flow here, m dot. And we're going to show that that's equal. Uh, and we're going to show, uh, we, we know that the network is 10, uh, 10 megawatts. We know what the specific heat capacity is. We know what our T4 is, our temperature at the outlet of our combustor. And we know what our T1 or T2 is here, which is our ambient temperature. What we need to know is T3. Uh, the temperature at the outlet of our compressor. And what we also need to know is T5, the temperature of, at the outlet of our turbine. But we know that these processes are isotropic, 
these compression and expansion processes. And we know that we have a relationship between the ratio of temperatures and our pressure ratio here, using again our gamma constant to relate the two for an isentropic process. So we can rewrite this as the T3, the temperature at the outlet of the compressor, equals T1 times the pressure ratio to the gamma minus one over gamma. And if we plug in what we know, T1 is the ambient temperature to 88.15, the pressure ratio of 6.766, and our gammas, we get a temperature at the outlet of our compressor of 497.64 Kelvin. Very similar thing with the T5. We know that, uh, that uh, the pressure ratio is uh, going to be 6.766 again, and we know that our T4 is going to be 1200 Kelvin, but the temperature is going to reduce during our expansion process. So we're going to divide 1200 Kelvin by 6.766 to the power of 1.4 minus one over 1.4. And that's gonna leave us with a turbine outlet temperature of 694.85 Kelvin. We now know these two temperatures and we simply have to figure out the mass flow. So if we rearrange this expression to show that the mass flow m dot is equal to the network divided by the specific heat capacity times the sum of the temperature differences. We plug in all of the parameters that we know. Um, then we come out with an air mass flow of 33.654 kilograms per second of air. So now we've calculated the most important properties for our gas turbine thermodynamic cycle. And we can present these to our customer and show that we're going to meet their requirements with the very simple cost-effective and productive gas turbine. So thank you very much. Uh, leave me a comment or a like in the comment section below, and let me know if you wanna see another video about some of the more advanced things that we can do with gas turbine technology. Thank you.